Hi, welcome to Virginia Time Travel, your portal to the Commonwealth's past, present, and future. Now, Northern Virginia is very urban, very built up, but people have lived here for centuries, and a significant portion of Fairfax County actually started out as something called the Ravensworth Land Grant. And our guest today is Mr. John Brown, who is the author of The Ravenworth Story. John, welcome to the show. Well, thanks for having me. So, what exactly was the Ravensworth land grant? Okay, well back in the, uh, in the uh, 1600s, latter part of the 1600s, uh, as colonists uh, populated uh, farther down in Virginia and land became scarce, they started buying land moving up north into, into the hinterlands. And uh, a man by the name of William Fitzhugh in 1685 bought what became the Ravensworth Land Grant, um, it was named later, uh, in 1685. And it was a, a, a parcel of land, uh, 24,000 acres if you can imagine, quite, quite, uh, uh, quite a parcel of land. Uh, he bought it from the proprietors of the Northern Neck Grant, and that was a five million acre grant that was given by uh, King Charles II of, of England uh, during the um, uh, about 1650 uh, to uh, when he was in exile with the uh, revolution that went on in England. So the five million acres was given to the, um, for six people, then through marriage, uh, death, so on, it uh, finally ended up in the hands of, of um, Lord Fairfax, six Lord Fairfax, uh, for which Fairfax County is named, and that, uh, that 24,000 acres was bought from the, out of the proprietors of the Northern Neck Grant. And now, Lord Fairfax was living over in England, so we always hear of this guy named King Carter. Now, how did he play into all of this? Well, um, Robert King Carter, who became the largest landowner in Virginia, uh, other than the, the people that inherited it, uh, he was an agent of the of the proprietors, as was William Fitzhugh. It's it's uh, probably William Fitzhugh's relationship with uh, the proprietors that had him know that this land was available at the time. But King Carter. After Fitzhugh died, uh, Robert King Carter became their agent for selling land, and I suspect that when he saw a nice parcel at a decent price, he set it aside and arranged to buy it himself. So, so Fitzhugh and Carter were like land agents for these exactly. British aristocrats. Right, right. I see, okay. So now, the land grant is that something that Fitzhugh bought or was given to him or how did that No, work? no, he bought it. He bought it. He bought it and it was, I forget the actual price, but it was uh, so much tobacco each year to be paid to the proprietors for oh, the for, for the land. Um, and so he essentially was leasing it then, but it, it, the, the arrangement became pretty much a, a form of ownership. So now exactly where was the land grant in okay. terms of modern uh, the land grant is in Fairfax County, kind of toward the center of it, uh, 24,000 acres out of a, uh, uh, it's about 10% of, of the um, acreage that did become Fairfax County in, much later in 1742. Now interestingly, uh, Fitzhugh didn't live there. He, oh. In fact, uh, um, none of his uh, descendants lived there for 100 years. Uh, so it was not developed early on. He lived. Uh, on the Potomac River, uh, on um, uh, two different plantations uh, in the northern neck of, uh, by the P Potomac, uh, southeast of uh, Fredericksburg. So he sought to, at first, lease it back when the um, uh, um, immigrants from France, the French Huguenots that were under religious persecution in in France uh, were offered uh, to come to the colony to populate, and he offered uh, leases to those folks. Um, we're guessing that uh, th he was successful leasing to them, but there are no public records that actually pinpoint that he, was, that he did. Why wouldn't he sell the land to them as opposed to lease it? I mean, he had a lot of land. He had a lot of land, that's <laughs> true. Well, 
Uh, I think back then, uh, I think he, he was not from an aristocratic family in England. Uh, his fortune uh, was made here. So land was a fortune at that time, uh, you know, very scarce money, uh, strict controls on trade in the colonies. Tobacco was uh, actually the, uh, the currency that was used, and, and they wanted the colonists to come here. Uh, get land, grow tobacco, send it back to England, and the merchants could make money on it. So he, um, for his, his own tr uh, trying to income, to put um, uh, people on it under leases, but uh, more than that was slaves. He would send an overseer and probably slaves up to um, the area and, um, and uh, probably starting on the waterways uh, because there were really no roads. Um, opening patches of, of land and, and starting to farm. Okay. Now, um, the Fitzhugh family continued living here, working this land for quite a long time. It did. Uh, William, uh, we call him William the Immigrant. Uh, now, when you look at the, uh, the Fitzhughes, there are a lot of Williams and there are a lot of Henrys. So, to, to sort them out and, and differentiate between them and among them, uh, there are, we parenthetically give them a subtitle. So he was William the Immigrant because he immigrated from, from England here. Uh, his, um, one of his sons was Henry, and uh, so he's uh, subtitled Henry Captain because he had a son uh, after him, who's Henry Colonel, and these, these titles come from their uh, <laughs> ranks in the militia yeah. at the time, uh, because uh, uh, being settlers and, and, you know, there was no police force, so they had a militia and, and, uh, and troops to defend from, from the Indians and, and maintain law and order. So um, Interesting. So now they build a house, and that's Ravensworth Mansion, or? Actually, they built three. Oh, okay. They built three. Uh, in 1701, William the Immigrant died, and his uh, Ravensworth was divided in half between his two oldest sons. And um, actually, Braddock Road is uh, the approximate dividing line of, of the north and south parts. So the um, Ravensworth Mansion, one of the houses built in 1796, was was the manor house for the south part of, of Ravensworth. Two other houses, Ossian Hall and Oak Hill, uh, were built in the northern portion, but they were built by descendants who had, herit had inherited um, one of seven different parcels in the north uh, through, uh, through death and in inheritance. And Oak Hill still survives as the yeah. only one of the three houses. Now is it, that's privately owned, I guess. Yes, it's privately oh. owned. Now, where, where was Ocean Hill uh, in today's? Ocean Hill was um, just inside the Beltway, off of Braddock Road, uh, where the Bristow um, subdivision is today. Okay. In fact, uh, um, the owner was, uh, at uh, the time when it was, uh, um, for a long time, was a Senator Bristow, who had bought an, a lot of land in the early 1900s here. And, um, Are there any ruins or anything? Or no, it, uh, all actually it was torn down. Oh, um, back see. in the days before, uh, people really said, hey, we have some uh, historic treasures we ought to oh. preserve. When was that torn down? Uh, that was torn down in the late 50s. Oh, dear. Yeah, so wow. maybe 1958, 1959. Now what about Ravensworth Mansion itself? Mm -hmm. Ravensworth Mansion uh, survived till 1926 and uh, was destroyed by fire. And where was that? And that was uh, just outside the Beltway, uh, off of Braddock Road where Ravensworth, um, uh, f uh, the Ravensworth uh, Shopping Center is. In fact, the, when the land was finally sold off at the end of the 50s, Ravensworth Shopping Center and Ravensworth Farm subdivision were created from much of that land. Oh, I see. Huh. But it burned in 1926. Uh, if you go to the shopping center, actually there are two historic signs there that tell some of the story of, of the house and the property. Interesting. Um, now, who are some of the notables that would be associated with this particular part of Fairfax County that we call the Ravensworth 
Okay. Well, Graham Grant. Uh, in in my uh, tracing of, of Ravensworth, when I kind of pick, you know, who were notables, they were, were either people that uh, uh, did something there or were related to uh, an owner. Uh, or, uh, so uh, George Washington, uh, he was a friend of um, uh, William Fitzhugh of Chatham, we call him, who uh, actually built Ravensworth Mansion. And Ravens, uh, um, uh, this William Fitzhugh was one of the founding fathers. He was a member of the Continental Congress and guiding uh, the early effort in the Revolutionary War. And uh, he was uh, a friend of Washington's. Actually, he was uh, uh, Washington's last social visit outside of his home before he died wow. was to William Fitzhugh. Wow. So, and uh, a couple members of the Washington family married into uh, there. Actually, um, William of Chatham's granddaughter um, married Robert E. Lee. And so there's a notable, I think, that right. people certainly in Virginia would 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 consider, and in fact, because um, one of his sons was actually named Fitzhugh Lee. Yes, right. yes, was well, William Fitzhugh Lee, right, uh, and um, William Henry Fitzhugh Lee, and uh, five of the Lee children uh, in 1874 inherited large parts of the southern part of of Ravensworth. And that's one of the interesting. Can I mention? Um, what you say uh, I almost said my favorite. <laughs> notable uh, uh, was um, William Marbury. Okay. Now, if if uh, if you know your uh, early um, government history, the Supreme Court in the early 1800s um, ruled on the case of Marbury versus Madison, and what it did was it established the um, the power of the Supreme Court of the United States to rule on the constitutionality of a of a law. Now. Um, I think everybody's watching what's going on with the, with the hearings with the current nominated judge. So, uh, and the one side argues very strongly that the Constitution ought to be construed just as written. Others, oh, they want to interpret a little bit with it. So, anyway, um, the power for the court to do that came from the suit by Marbury. Marbury was an average lawyer, lived in Washington, D.C. And when John Adams was about to leave the presidency, he made about 40, you know, midnight appointments before he left uh, to offices. And when Thomas Jefferson became president, he refused to recognize that. He n nominated his own people. Marbury disputed that, said, hey, I want my job. He filed and it went to the Supreme Court and it was not so much, I don't even know that I know, I think he was unsuccessful getting the job, but um, so the Supreme Court established its uh, supremacy there. So that's when the Supreme Court became like the, the honest broker, is that? Exactly. Uh -huh. Now, um, how Marbury's connected, his daughter, Mary Ann, married a Fitzhugh. Uh -huh. And um, so he is one of the notables I would point to. Now, it's, it's very interesting to me in Virginia. I mean, whenever you go to any historic site, I mean, you see the same names. They all seem to intermarry, and they, if you were a Washington, somehow you were connected with the Lees mm -hmm. and connected to the Fitzhughes and connected to the Birds, and uh, it, it's fascinating. It is. It is. Well, they inter, uh, they tended to intermarry, and there was a lot of marrying of cousins as well. Mm. You know, they wanted to. They didn't want to um, dilute uh, the, the, the wealth in the land. So these would be like the, what they call the first families of Virginia. Is that they were? Uh -huh. Yeah. If you go to a book of first families of Virginia, you'll find the Fitzhughes in there. Uh -huh. uh, they were less successful. Um, they had too many children, I think. Uh, other than the line that, that resulted in the Lees, um, the um, Henry Captain, who in, inherited the north part of, um, of Ravensworth, uh, his son had numerous children. And um, so the north part was divided up into seven different pieces. And so you take 12,000 acres, divide it up into seven pieces, you've got yeah. you know, even smaller. So. Yeah. Now, one of the interesting things is, um, I guess, Route 236, what we call the Little River Turnpike, mm -hmm. runs smack dab through the Ravensworth Tract. It does. So 
Can you tell us a little about the history of Little River Turnpike? Sure, sure. Um, it was uh, actually, uh, it was a, Little River Turnpike was early development of new technology and road building in, in the United States, and it's one of the first turnpikes that were built. Um, for years, the merchants in the, um, the port town of Alexandria, the river port, which was a, a, a major commerce uh, center, uh, they wanted access to uh, farm products to the west over Blue Ridge Mountains and beyond. And the farmers wanted access to the commercial center to be able to sell their products. So the uh, Little River Turnpike was uh, created by a private company authorized by the state of Virginia. Virginia didn't build any roads back then. Uh, they. Um, they authorized individuals to do it, in this case a private company, and uh, as important as that road was, is still I guess, uh, it was just 34 miles long. It, they started in 1803, they completed about 1826, and um, uh, the the road follows uh, the same route and the, the portion between I think uh, Interstate 395 and the, and the edge of Fairfax City is still Little River Turnpike. Um, toward Alexandria it's Duke Street and then it becomes Main Street going through. through um, so how the, much did they charge to use the road? Well they had, uh, it was a toll road uh, so um, the uh, I forget what the numbers are, but they charged uh, a, a different amount if it was a carriage with wow. or a wagon, a wagon carrying uh, produce, then it was more than it was if an individual rider was there. And the way they built it was, if you can imagine, original roads were just pretty much paths through the forest. Uh, they weren't prepared, the roadbed wasn't prepared much in any way. So that was fine in nice weather and it was fine for horses, but if you put a heavy ox cart on there on a muddy road, uh, pretty soon it's a mess. So uh, this uh, Little River Turnpike was, uh, had a, a paved by rock and gravel center portion that was used for wet weather and winter weather and then side, uh, uh, narrower side portions that were used for foot traffic, horse traffic, that type of thing. Now, you know, we've talked about, um, you know, this was a kind of a, farming area. So what was the uh, uh, association of, of enslaved people with the Ravensworth tract? Are there any episodes that? Yeah, I would, I would say to start with, um, Ravensworth was made possible by slavery. Um, you know, the, the Fitzhughes didn't do the work themselves, somebody else had to do it. So uh, there was that to it. So. Um, I won't say virtually every, but m almost all owners of Ravensworth land up uh, before the Civil War owned slaves. Um, many of those that leased land uh, from the Fitzhughes owned slaves. And um, if you try to trace um, slaves back, you really hit a wall of unknowing. Uh, my guru on on uh, investigating the slavery was uh, Maddie McCoy, who has a, uh, uh, a slavery inventory database that she has, uh, has developed since uh, about 2005. If you haven't interviewed her about that, that would be a, a, a good program for this show. But anyway, uh, she points out that um, y you can't find out because you go back to early census, the only record of a, of a slave was a count of an owner had so many slaves because they were gonna tax them. It was like livestock. A little bit later, census decided, well, they would do um, not just a count, but they would identify how many males and females in the age. Again, for tax reasons, because they were taxed at different levels. If you look at the, at the census um, uh, reports, it would list the, the, uh, the death of tithables, that was the white people who lived on, on the property, and then the slaves by age and count, and then the horses and the wagons. Mm -hmm. um, and that's the way the tax was done. Mm -hmm. um, so it's tough to get back to that. Mm -hmm. What I, I did do was uh, I was able to, with some, um, through estate inventories, when somebody died, they would list all the slaves by name. And um, 
usually there was no surname. So, you know, it was a Charles and Jim and, and, and Elsie and, 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 and like that. But uh, for um, William Henry Fitzhugh, who died in 1830, in his will declared that all his slaves would be freed in 1850, his estate inventory listed by name his 200 plus slaves. And then in 1850, um, when those at Ravensworth were freed, they went to the county court and they registered as, as free blacks. And so they were recorded by first and last name. So, so it's, it's tough to get, but you can get it. And uh, so Maddie's the person to talk to on how to do it. Trace those families after they were. Yes. Interesting. Now, um, are there, this is such a heavily developed area now, are there any actual historic landmarks that people can see or visit? Yeah, I would mention first Oak Hill. Oak Hill is off of Wakefield Chapel Road, um, close to uh, Braddock Road. It was one of the three original mansions and it's privately owned. Um, back in 2005 or six, Fairfax County entered into a uh, an historic easement arrangement with the, uh, the developer that owned it and the developer got a, a, some tax benefits and, and the county got access to the property. So the easement requires certain restrictions on what can be done to the exterior of the building. It also requires that it be available for uh, the public at least four times a year. Oh. So the owners uh, since 2006 have been very willing to have an open house which occurs uh, end of September, about the 1st of October. Keep, you know, look, it's widely advertised, especially through the, uh, the Fairfax County Park system because uh, they're one of the supporters of it. And then the, um, the, uh, the group that got me started in, in, in doing local history, the look back at Braddock History Project that um, then Braddock District Supervisor Sharon Bulova started. Uh, volunteers of that group still um, uh, volunteer to support that open house. And it's, you can tour the lower, lower level of the house, you can tour the grounds, box which they're original all the way back to the 1790s, and uh, usually some um, local history events going on, some speakers. Is there a family about. cemetery there? Uh, no, there's oh, not. Okay. Yeah, it's interesting where they must have been buried. Uh, actually, uh, we know that the Fitzhughes from the Ravensworth side of the family, the ones where the Ravensworth mansion, were um, um, William of Chatham and, and his wife and William Henry and, and so on, they're at uh, the, um, the church in, um, on um, um, Route 1, uh, uh, the famous church over on, and I'm losing the, uh, the, the name of it, um, over near Fort Belvoir. They were all moved there when the... Uh, oh, Pro um, Poic Church. Yeah, Poic Church. Uh, they were moved there when the plan was sold for Ravensworth Shopping Center. Oh, so, But I the see. others, uh, we don't know. Well, that's interesting. Um, now, I know over at Lank Ankatink, there's a, a railroad bridge, and I guess during the Civil War that was like some kind of trestle bridge. Um, yes. So I guess there are a few... Civil War stories associated with? Well, the, uh, the Orange and Alexandria Railroad that connected um, uh, was, uh, from Alexandria West uh, was a major uh, transportation artery for the Union and also for those parts of it that the Confederate uh, Army controlled for them as well um, uh, when you got down toward where I live now near, near Warrington. Um, but um, yes, the, uh, the railroad was attacked in many different places, bridges burned and, and blown up and so on. Um, and uh, actually, uh, John Mosby, if those who follow the exploits of the, uh, the Grey Ghost, got his start on um, Jeb's, uh, General Jeb Stewart's raid on Burke Station uh, when they, uh, when they uh, captured the station, they sent their fa famous telegraph, uh, telegram to the Union uh, uh, Quartermaster General saying um, that they were very disappointed in the quality of the, of the mules that they um, had obtained there. Uh, on that raid, he turned Mosby loose with nine men to go harass, you know, as he could. So that was the beginning of that. But Mosby was continually attacking the, um, the railroad there. 
I'd like to mention uh, not only um, have, I, have I written the book that you're interviewing me about, but the book is um, the follow-on to what's been my website that I've had online since 2013. And um, I had really hoped that I could just... And I think your book is available on Amazon. It is, and, um, yes. So that's great. We're wishing you a lot of luck with it, John. And right. We definitely want to thank you for coming today. And as a little gift of our book, Historic Cemeteries of Northern Virginia. Um, and yeah, you may you. want to look at John's other book, Braddock's True Gold, which he did the maps for, which is a, another fine, scholarly, right. yet engaging book that I bring to your attention. And we want to thank you for tuning in to Virginia Time Travel, your portal to the Commonwealth's past, present, and future. Please visit our website at uh, www.timetravel21.com. And thanks for watching. I'll see you next time.